My name is uh, Chinidu Chukudinma, but you can remember me as Chin, and I will be your host and chair for this session, which is called A Rebel's Guide to Marxism in the 21st Century. And today we are very, very lucky to have with us a fantastic speaker, uh, Camilla Roy. Now, Camilla is a member of, a, of the Central Committee of the Socialist Workers' Party, and she's also, well, she's also the author of A Rebel's Guide to, to Engels. And just to give a bit of background on how these meetings work. So Camilla will speak for a maximum of 25 minutes. And afterwards, there'll be plenty of time for uh, questions and contributions. And then I'll bring Camilla back for a quick sum up for five to 10 minutes. So Camilla, the floor is yours whenever you want. Great, thanks Chin. Um, so I've got the task of trying to give an overview of the whole of Marxism in uh, about 25 minutes maximum. So I'll try and at least cover the, um, what I think are the main things. Uh, so Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels were born over 200 years ago now. They're two bearded men of the 19th century. So what can they teach us today in the 21st century? Uh, because there are many different opinions about Marx. Um, for some, he was the evil founder of communism. He was kind of in part responsible for all the worst crimes, or some, many of the worst crimes of the 20th century, Stalinist Russia, yeah, the regime in North Korea, China today. Um, I think we should reject this kind of view. I think, you know, if we could ask Marx today, he wouldn't see these kind of regimes as having anything to do with Marxism. Um, for others in, perhaps in universities, Marx is seen as an interesting philosopher, very influential person with some, some good ideas about economics. Um, you know, if you're in, you know, if you're teaching geography like I do or in sociology, they kind of can't avoid saying something about Marx, but he's also seen as someone who is very flawed and not someone whose political views we might not necessarily want to uphold. And there are also others who say that Marx didn't really have enough to say about issues like women's liberation, anti-imperialism, anti-racism. And you know, we've had a discussion earlier already about was Marx eco um, Eurocentric, was the only real really of interest to, to people in Europe. Um, people say he reduced everything to economics, that you know, it was, that Marxism is just about putting class before everything else. Um, and therefore it's, it's reductionist. Um, you know, of course, Marx didn't get to write on every different topic and he didn't actually even finish all of the things that he wanted to write in his in his own lifetime and there are many thinkers that have come after Marx and added to his thinking or applied his ideas to, to new situations that we've come across into other topics and you know as, as they should but I think there are there are several key reasons why we should still look to Marx um, for one thing, he developed a philosophical method, um, a way of understanding the world that is um, that we call historical materialism and a kind of philosophical method that we call dialectics. It's a way of trying to make sense of the world that we live in today. Um, also, and especially in his, his masterpiece Capital, he put forward an analysis of how the capitalist system works, you know, a system that is rooted in exploitation and a system that is prone to crisis. Um, and we can still see today that we live in a system that creates huge inequality and exploitation. You know, we have a system that can put, that can mean that Jeff Bezos, one man, can make $320 million per day. Uh, where we have the technology that can land a rover on the surface of Mars and fly a helicopter on the surface of Mars, can't we? But we can't supply oxygen to, uh, to everyone in India. Um, when we put the profits for vaccine manufacturers before the health of the vast majority of the world's population, it's, it's pretty evident, I think, that the question that's dominating everything is the question of capitalism, what kind of system that we live in. And for that, Marx is really important as he's the key theorist of capitalism. Um, so where to kind of start with his ideas? I think the first thing I, I would say we need to understand is that Marx and Engels and other Marxists developed their theory from the standpoint of the working class. They were not neutral in the struggle between workers and capitalists. They were firmly on the side of workers. Um, 
and you know they wanted to change the world not just kind of observe the world in a sort of neutral way um, Marx very famously said in Physis on Feuerbach that philosophers have hitherto only interpreted the world in various ways the point is to change it and they both in their lifetimes advocated for worker struggle uh, in practice as uh, as well as in theory um, Marx was a political journalist in um, in his early life and in doing that he was very inspired by things like the major revolt among the Silesian weavers that's in um, part of the world that's now in now in Poland but in 1844 you had this militant revolt where 5,000 weavers uh, burst into the um, the homes and the factories of their bosses and uh, they destroyed machinery they they took these measures because they were you know partly out of desperation they were facing wage cuts that they couldn't survive on those wages um, but it was the first kind of one of the first key uprisings of industrial workers um, Engels also was very inspired by similarly militant strike action in um, in Britain actually and by things like the Chartist movement the working class based movement for, for suffrage uh, and they were involved in revolutions as well um, Marx and Engels wrote the communist manifesto you know, as part of a communist organization that they were part of uh, yeah, they would have called themselves communists back then um, and you know when Europe was swept by revolutions in 1848 they were both part of organizing within within those revolutions um, yeah Engels at Marx's graveside said that Marx was first and foremost a revolutionist uh, but they as well as kind of praising the courage of workers taking strike action um, they also analyzed the kind of system that workers live in it wasn't just about uh, reporting on workers' struggles it wasn't just about sympathy for their suffering. They also came to the understanding that it's the working class um, as a class that has the potential to overthrow capitalism. That was yeah, central to to their thought. Uh, at this this time in the sort of 1840s, it was quite um, kind of kind of common among intellectuals to assume that a revolution would be led by the more educated. Um, yeah, the more reasoned section of society, maybe the more middle class elements of society. Um, yeah, Marx and Engels said, no, it's, it's the mass of the working class that have the potential to change, change everything. Uh, you know, as we know, that potential isn't always realised, but that's where the potential lies. And they also started at this time to develop their philosophical ideas. Um, Marx and Engels had a materialist worldview, sometimes described as historical materialism. And this really kind of means that it's not just the actions of people at the top of society. Uh, you know, often if we do history in school, we're told that uh, you know it's kings and queens and prime ministers and world leaders that change things. Um, you know, Marx and Engels again said it's ordinary people who, who make make history through class struggle. Um, neither are the ideas that change things. Uh, they got quite frustrated with uh, with idealist philosophy that assumes that society changes as new ideas come about and um you know that's really what what drives society society forward new inventions and, and ideas uh for them they, they said that you had to start with material reality what kind of situation do people do people live in how do ordinary people organize together to uh to produce the things that they need to eat and drink and the clothes that they need to clothe themselves and housing how do they produce all the things that they need to to survive and um, Marx and Engels said that the starting point for understanding history is actually to look at how human beings relate to nature so um, Engels again said that mankind must first of all eat drink have shelter and clothing before it can pursue politics science art religion etc uh, I think it's quite a quite an ecological way of thinking as well that you're starting with um, you know basically how do people um how do people get food and and drink and shelter and clothing and that and things like that that's you know a relationship with the natural world so they were talking about they were kind of seeing ecology as one of the pillars on which their philosophy is built not just something that we add in as an afterthought when we talk about about economics um but of course humans don't just uh, don't just try to survive as individuals we're also social animals we need to organize together in societies of different types in order to to produce things and and we've lived in many different types of society throughout history um, you know actually capitalism might kind of seem like it's been been around forever and that it's always 
been like this and it always will be like this you know we we're told there is no alternative but actually um, if you look at the grand sweep of human history capitalism is only, has only existed for a very short period of time relatively recently um, this kind of relates to another key point about Marx and Engels which is that their idea of human nature is that we have a changing human nature um, again some people say you know socialism won't ever work because human nature just doesn't allow for socialism you know are we kind of naturally selfish and individualistic uh, but you know Marx and Engels in their time were very critical of the kind of people that naturalize that kind of idea of human nature they, they look at what human humans are like under capitalism and they assume that that's how humans have always been and always will be and uh, you know for Marx again we humans change our own natures by by acting on the world and that also that also changes us um i could um i should say a little bit about alienation as well uh, i won't have time to discuss this in in detail but um alienation is really marx and engels saying that capitalism doesn't fulfill human needs it's an anti-human system that when we produce things in a capitalist system we don't own the things that we produce as workers those products of our labour um, then belong to the capitalist that employs us. Um, you know, he said that those products of our labour stand above and against us. They don't seem like things that we ourselves have produced, but they seem like things that are alien from us. Uh, capitalism also alienates us from what it is to be human, from our own labour power. Um, and it alienates us from, from other human beings as well and treats us all as individuals that have to kind of compete with, with each other. Um, they, when they understood human history, they understood it using this kind of materialist understanding. They talked about human history being kind of driven by, by class struggle. Um, to give kind of um, a brief example, um, if you look at the, the American Civil War, it was a, an, um, yeah, it was, it's a moment in history that could be understood using um using materialist ideas that it wasn't just ideas that meant that you had a war between the north and the us and, and the south it wasn't just that one side um you know suddenly decided that they're going to be against slavery in the north and another side that decided that they're going to be in favor of slavery in the south it wasn't just that abraham lincoln and people around him just suddenly arrived at more progressive ideas that they wanted to end end slavery no it was you can explain it you know, economically. It was a war about what kind of society America is going to be. Is it going to be a system based on plantations and the export of cotton? Or is it going to be a system based on industrial capitalism and you know, like the North with people in cities working for for employers? And you know, it's about the types of system and about the different forces on either side that can organize for one side or the other. Um, so there's you know, Marx um, talked about a base and a superstructure. There's an economic basis to the way that society works and ideas and institutions um, form part of the superstructure on that base. But for that, I don't want to give you the impression that it's just a determinist um, kind of philosophy. Uh, it's not that the ideas or politics don't matter. You know, of course they matter. We're talking about ideas and politics here, in, um, here at Marxism this weekend and you know Engels made it clear he says according to the materialistic conception of history the production and reproduction of real life constitutes in the last instance the determining factor of history neither Marx nor I maintained more um, he didn't want people to distort Marxist thinking into saying that economics is the only factor driving history but he did want to emphasize the role of economics um, in re response to people who were who were not talking about about economics and um, of course Marx is mostly known for his uh, his economic work and for his his capital for his understanding of the system um, he actually after the um, 1848 revolutions when both Marx and Engels came back to Britain he said um, he said in 1851 uh, to Engels I'm so far advanced that in five weeks I'll be through with the whole economic shit but um, even 30 years later, when he died in 1883, still wasn't complete, uh, completely free with the, the economics. Uh, he wanted to understand 
capitalism and how it works and where this system has come from, how did we get to capitalism, but also what are the dynamics of the system and you know, where is capitalism, where is capitalism going at in, in the future. Um, this basic understanding, um, and I think um, in other sessions people have talked about, about class as well, but um, in capitalism it's very different from the feudal system that came before it, radically different. Um, in feudalism you have a feudal lord who extracts um, you know, tithe labour from, the, um, from their subjects and they just build up they just build up wealth for themselves and um, you know they use it to buy good things for themselves and food and stuff and um, capitalism isn't like that it's not just someone building up wealth for themselves capital is um is wealth that is invested and as a capitalist you don't just build, you don't just collect up your money you have to invest it back into your business and you expect when you invest it that you get more money back um, as a return on your investment, don't you? Otherwise, you're, you, you're going to fail as a capitalist. Um, so how do they get more money back than they put in? Um, it's not magic, it's because they employ workers to do that. They, um, they employ workers, they give them a wage um, in money, but what they get back when they employ workers is labour power. And labour power is quite a specific form of commodity. It's not like buying any other type of commodity. It's buying something that was one, once it's put to work produces value for, for the capitalist. Um, so the capitalists kind of getting more than they pay for um, when they employ us to do work. Uh, you can see this, can't you, in the, in the pandemic. Um, when, if you remember about a year ago now, um, a lot of us were in lockdown. Some people were unable to work and were furloughed, being you know paid uh, kind of benefit to, because they couldn't go and do their paid work. And there was a massive crash in the in the economy. Um, really shows that it's not um, it's not the actions of people at the top of society that keep the economy going. It's ordinary workers going going into work every day that keeps things going. Um, Marx said this about 150 years ago. Um, he says that every child knows a nation which ceased to work, I will not say for a year, but even for a few weeks would perish, that you get this, it's hugely damaging to the, to the economy. Capitalists need to exploit workers. Um, and there's a, uh, you know, there's a tension between the capitalist and the worker. You know, they want to lower our wages and, you know, we want to keep our, our wages, um, keep our wages rising. We have to struggle with them. Uh, but capitalists also struggle with each other and and compete with each other. Um, Marx kind of said that the werewolf, they have a werewolf like hunger for surplus value for, for profits. And that's because they need to compete with each other um, in order to avoid going bust, in order to avoid um, complete catastrophe for them. They're compelled um, to compete with each other. Um, just look at the fossil fuels industry. Uh, we all know, and they probably know, as well that um, you know if we keep digging up fossil fuels out of the ground and keep burning them then that is going to lead to to catastrophic climate change uh, it might be runaway climate change um, but they still do it they still dig up fossil fuels and and um, you know and, and sell them and make huge profits from it and they do that because they're compelled to because of the system that they live in because they have to compete otherwise their shareholders would go and invest in some other fossil fuel company um, and what I kind of um, end on perhaps is that we also have the, the state and the state is a kind of institution that's part of that kind of superstructure that I talked about or um, perhaps more properly it's a whole series of, of institutions. It consists of things like the monarchy, government, parliaments, the police force, the judiciary, uh, you know, aspects of the welfare state, postal service, all that kind of thing. And um, in the modern world we have nation states so a state that's connected to to a nation um, and a state that's meant to embody the interests of all the people that live within that that nation state um it we can sometimes sort of think of it as a, as a neutral force but marx and engels were clear that it's not a neutral force state doesn't represent the people as a whole it represents the interests of the dominant class within society uh, just look at the role of the the police today um they are you know, clearly acting in the interests of the ruling class. Um, they're 
role and you know we could have a whole long discussion about the police but essentially their role is to is to maintain the interests of uh, of the ruling class and to and to stop us you know they even want to stop us protesting now they accept all of the racist and sexist ideas of the type of society that they exist to uphold and um, you know, respectable kind of politicians will say well um you know will accept the role of the state even good left-wing politicians like Jeremy Corbyn and Diane Abbott here in Britain and other left-wing politicians in other parts of the world will tend to tend to accept that we need a kind of state um, you know they accept and sometimes they even you know call for putting more police on the streets um, I think it's becoming more and more discussed now that um, you know actually want to defund the police do we even do we even need them but uh, but for most but, but for most politicians they accept that kind of role of the state. Um, so what do so what do we want? Um, or for for Marx and for for Engels, what they talked about was the emancipation of the working class uh, must be the act of the working class itself. Um, in the Socialist Workers Party, which I'm a member of, um, we we uphold that that kind of view. Um, we talk about socialism from below, um, not socialism from above, as they had in. Um, in, you know, in, in Stalin's Russia, in the Soviet Union, uh, but socialism from below, something won by the working class um, ourselves. And uh, yeah, and um, you know, that was a, it's a distinction between us and kind of reformist socialists, people who want to win elections and use that to try and get into office and use that to try and run the existing state. Uh, you know, we've come across politicians who want to win elections and Run the run the state in a more progressive way, and yeah, you know, sometimes we'll even we'll even vote for them. Um, you know, we've had this discussion already earlier earlier today. Uh, you know, sometimes we'll, we'll vote for Labour, but I think we should be under no illusions that vote, just voting for people to run society on our behalf will really bring about socialism. Yeah, you know, what we're, we're for is is revolution for the working class, and and we're for international revolution as well. Um, Marx and Engels were were consistent internationalists. They talked about workers of the world uniting. They talked about the class struggle being an international struggle. Um, yeah, they recognised that uh, we have more in common with workers um, from other parts of the world than we do with our own national ruling class. Uh, again, it goes against the kind of common sense in society that we're expected to align with our, our nation state. Uh, you know, we have politicians you know, waving the national flag, expecting us to kind of support sending British gunships over to defend Jersey from the, the French or whatever they're, they're doing now. Um, you know, we say, no, we're not for lining up with the interests of our ruling class. Um, I think the kind of vision of revolution that, that we want is something that will involve the mass of, of, um, of working class people. And it's, it's a vision of, um, of revolution that will tear out the roots of all forms of oppression. Um, we can, you know, address women's oppression, oppression of, uh, of racialized minorities, of people in, in other parts of the world. Uh, you know, it's, it's the working class that um, in liberating itself lays the foundations for the liberation of all. And you know, we want to you know, ultimately use that to create you know, a kind of classless society that, that we all want to see based on, based on equality and based, based on democracy.